Along with accepting some reality and uncertainty, we know that worriers also avoid uncomfortable experiences. So one of the things we ask our patients to do is to list all the things that they're avoiding right now and to begin doing these things one by one. The goal is what I call constructive discomfort and successful imperfection. Now, what is constructive discomfort? This is it. You have to be uncomfortable to grow and change. You have to do things that you really don't want to do. That's constructive discomfort. And what is successful imperfection? It's simply this. You have to make progress doing things imperfectly. Success is purchased at the price of imperfection. Now, I found these ideas to be very, very empowering for our patients here in New York City. Once you realize that you're already uncomfortable because you are a worrier and probably a little depressed, you can at least use your discomfort to make progress. You can use discomfort as a tool to get better. If you're going to be uncomfortable anyway. You may as well be doing things that are constructive while you're uncomfortable. The third step deals with how you evaluate your thinking. Now, worriers have what we call thought-reality fusion, a fancy term, thought-reality fusion. What does this mean? Worriers think that if I think I might get rejected, then it's going to turn out true. So they think that their thought is going to turn into a reality, thought-reality fusion. And then they think unless I worry about it and do everything to be sure it doesn't happen. So they think that the worry is going to prevent the bad outcome. They'll be able to anticipate things. They'll be able to see things happening. They'll be able uh, to reverse the bad trends. Worries are like obsessions in this sense. People treat their thoughts like they're really facts. So we also look at typical thinking errors or distortions that worriers have. And these include things like mind reading, for example. He thinks I'm a loser or jumping to conclusions. I don't know something, therefore I will fail. Or what we call emotional reasoning. Oh, I feel nervous, so things won't work out. Or perfectionism. I need to be perfect to be confident. Or a lot of worriers discount the positive. They think the fact that I have done well in the past is no guarantee of anything. Worriers also have sudden emergency ideas, like something suddenly bad is going to happen, such as slippery slope thinking. They think if this train continues, it could just keep going downward fast. Or they have a trapdoor thought. I could make a mistake and my whole life could fall apart. Worriers can challenge and test out their thinking using cognitive therapy techniques that I describe in the worry cure, such as, you know, what's the worst outcome? that you could expect? What's the best outcome? What's the most likely outcome? You'd ask yourself, what are all the things that I could do to deal with a real problem if it actually did exist? You could ask yourself, is there any evidence that things could turn out okay? Maybe things could turn out okay. Or you could ask, am I making the same wrong predictions that I always make? Have you been making a lot of really negative predictions for years that haven't come true? Don't forget that, as I said, the research shows that 85% of the things that worriers worry about actually have a positive outcome. Now, the fourth step in handling your worries is to recognize how your personality plays a role in your problem. We also know that people different from one another in what they worry about. Now, some people worry about money. Other people worry about health. Other people worry about what people think of them. So worry is also related to your personality. For example, You may be concerned about being abandoned or you might be concerned about becoming helpless and unable to take care of yourself. Or you may worry that you're not religious enough or moral enough or you worry about not being that superior special person. Now, we can use cognitive therapy techniques to help people modify these concerns. For example, we can examine the costs and benefits of thinking in such a rigid all-or-nothing terms. Or you can ask yourself, what advice you would give a friend who had these worries. A lot of times we're really good at giving other people advice that we might be wise to take ourselves. Or we can set up experiments where you don't ask for reassurance or you don't act perfectly or you spend some time alone if you think you're always going to need someone and find out what really happens. You can also practice writing assertive statements to the parent who taught you all these negative things about yourself. You can challenge the source of these negative thoughts about yourself. Some of that could be quite useful to you. 
The fifth step involves your ideas about the future. Now, worriers think uh, that failure is certain and is unacceptable and that everything can be viewed as a possible failure. So if you go to a party and someone is not friendly, then you think you have failed. When I was in college, I had a friend, his name was Fred, who wrote a term paper for an economics course. It was a plan at that time for an overnight mailing service in the United States. His professor gave him a low grade. The professor thought, this is unrealistic. It's never going to work. Well, after Fred graduated from Yale, he went on and became the founder of Federal Express. Uh, I don't remember who the professor was, but Fred Smith is pretty successful. In my book, The Worry Cure, I outline 20 strategies that you can deal with to deal with your fear of failure. So examples of some of these include the following. If you think about failure, you know, I can focus on what I can control. I can focus on other behaviors that will succeed. It wasn't essential to succeed at that. There were some behaviors that did pay off. Everyone fails at something. Maybe nobody noticed. Did I have the right goal? Failure is not fatal. Were my standards too high? Did I do better than before? All of us fail, by the way. But the key thing is how do you bounce back from failure? How do you put it in perspective? And some of that is spelled out in the book. The sixth step deals with how you handle your emotions. What's interesting here is that research actually shows that worry is a form of emotional avoidance. When people engage in worry, they're activating the thinking part of their brain and not allowing themselves to feel an emotion. Worry is actually abstract thinking. When you stop, though, that whole string of what-ifs, that thinking part, worriers then experience an intense emotion, such as tension, sweating, heart beating, or insomnia. And we found that worriers have a hard time even labeling their emotions and they also have very, very negative views about their emotions. We help worriers accept and value their emotions and recognize that others have the same feelings that they do, that it's okay to have mixed feelings, since mixed feelings is like having more color in a painting. And we also help people realize that your painful emotions can point to your needs and your higher values. Emotions are also temporary if you allow them to just be and not try to control them or eliminate them. It's like the water flowing through the river. Finally, worriers think that the bad event that they're worried about is approaching them very, very rapidly. This is their sense of urgency. They think that their failure, their rejection, their financial ruin or life-threatening illness is coming at them very, very rapidly. Everything is an emergency. Worriers say, I need to know right now. What we do is we teach worriers how to turn off that urgency how to step back from their fear of the future, how to live and enjoy the present moment. Warriors can